course, this is Louis the Fourteenth. This is the magnificent palace that that he built when the uh, French Empire was at its peak. And this is the main entrance. This place, like you know, sets the, the bar for opulence, I guess you can say. And of course, there's always all kinds of, of works with the um, with the stonework, with the lattice work, with the metal work. This is the famous Hall of Mirrors. And so this is where the um, Treaty of Versailles was, was signed, which ended the war to end all wars. You know how that one went after World War I, 100 years ago. So this is the famous Hall of Mirrors. Needless to say, it's a busy place. You don't exactly get a private tour. You don't get to have it to yourself. But pretty spectacular place, if I do say so. And there's the, I'm sorry, I couldn't quite get the roof in focus there. There's the murals on the roof and, of course, the grand chandeliers. All right, so what are we going to talk about today? We're going to talk about glaucoma. And any path lecture regarding glaucoma starts with the trabecular meshwork. And so this happens to be a particularly beautiful piece of meshwork. When you guys do your path rotations, you'll see when we get trabeculectomy specimens, they do not have trabs on them most of the time, and they're often just sclera, but this happens to be a beautiful one. So when we're talking about the trabecular meshwork, there's different ways to break it down. And the first way is, is you can do the anatomic way of looking at the angle as you're looking at it with the gonio mirror. So when you're looking at it with the gonio mirror, you're looking into, into the anterior chamber angle. Um, we're going to go ahead and, and start, say, uh, Catherine, what denotes the apex of the angle? What is the, the first thing that you'll see when you look in with the gonio mirror? Uh, you'll see the... Schwabby's line. Schwabby's line. And what is Schwabby's line? It's the end of uh, Decimase membrane. Exactly. So where Decimase membrane terminates, there's a little, it, sometimes there's a bump, sometimes there's a little line, but Schwabby's line, and so that denotes the um, beginning of the trabecular meshwork. And if you look, the trabecular meshwork is triangular. This is the apex, and here's the base down here. It's a triangular shape. So when we're looking in with the gonio marrow, also, Sean, there's a couple of different ways we denote the meshwork here. So first, from Schwabi's line, what's the next part of trabecular meshwork posteriorly? The non-pigmented. The non-pigmented meshwork. And because it's kind of thinner at the apex there, you don't have a lot of chance of pigment gathering there. So when you look in, it'll, it'll be a paler line. Okay, and, and Teresa, what's the next area here? The pigmented, yeah. the pigmented trabecular meshwork. And so, that's where sometimes where you get liberated pigment granules, they'll gather up, up right there. And Rachel, what is the, the kind of the base of the meshwork here? The scleral spur. The scleral spur. So when you look in, you'll see a little line that denotes the scleral spur. Now, when you think of the trabecular meshwork, you've got to think of it in three dimensions. And so the apex is here, the base is here, the scleral spur acts as a little lip. You know, it goes around 360 degrees, and the meshwork sits in that scleral spur, and it, it almost like a little shelf that the trabecular meshwork sits on. So if you're looking in with the gonium here, sometimes underneath the scleral spur, you'll actually see uh, this structure right here, Ariana. That's actually the root of the iris. So you can actually sometimes see even part of the iris or part of the ciliary body when you're looking in there, all right? So the other part of the trabecular meshwork we can do is, is you can also divide it vertically, if you will, for the corneal and the uveal scleral meshwork. But then also, this part of the meshwork right here is particularly important. Allie, what is that called? The juxtacanalicular. And therefore, that means this is what? Schlem's canal, all right? So when you think of Schlem's canal, it's not a round tube. It's kind of an um, oval area, and this is it right here. And again, you think of the, the trabecular meshwork in three dimensions. Schlem's canal runs all the way around. And so this is Schlem's canal. It's this juxtacanalicular tissue that is important because a lot of people think that's where the impedance to flow of aqueous is, and that may be what's involved in open angle glaucoma. 
So it's the, it's the juxtacanalicular tissue that's important. All right, here's a close-up. Let's, let's talk a little bit about the flow of, of aqueous, all right? So wow, we're graced with a senior today. Wow, this is like <laughs> special. Um, all right, so tell us, where's the aqueous humor made? In the ciliary body. Made in the ciliary body, and then how does it get to the trabecular meshwork? So it's made in the ciliary body, wraps around the iris, through the pupil, and then into the uh, trabecular meshwork. Okay. So here's the meshwork, here's that juxtacanalicular tissue. Here is Schlemp's canal. Chris, good evening. Hello. Um, so it gets into Schlemp's canal. Where does the aqueous humor go after that? Um, so it goes to the juxtacanalicular tissue and then it'll eventually get into the veins, uh, aqueous veins and go to the veins. Exactly, so here's the aqueous veins and it'll eventually make its way out to the circulation. And here's a close up, there's that juxtacanalicular tissue. Now, the trabecular meshwork is not just a wide open meshwork. There actually are endothelial cells lining it, and there is both active and passive transport of aqueous through there. So it's not just passive flow through this meshwork of, of tissue. All right, so here we're showing that nicely. Here is the trabecular meshwork. Here's Slim's canal. Here's one of those aqueous veins. And then you see it drains out right into the plexus here, the episcleral plexus. And so I always tell you this every year, your mission is when you're at the VA or in clinic looking at patients, find an aqueous vein, because we never think about these, we never look for them. So if you're looking with the slit lamp just beyond the edge of the limbus, deep, you know, in the episcleral plexus, you'll actually see some aqueous veins and look like there'll be a vessel with blood in it, but then you'll get box scarring of the vessels. So you get aqueous flowing there with the little red blood cells in between. So your mission today, find one of those aqueous veins. And, and you look at it, you go, oh, yeah, they're there. God, why haven't I seen that before? So they're really there. So that's your mission for today. Find them. That's just with the slit lamp, not with gonio? Slit lamp. No, no, it's actually outside because remember, it's on the, it's on the episcleral plexus. Got it. And so the aqueous veins drain it through the trachea measure, through Schlem's canal, and then through the sclera, to that little plexus that's, that's on the um, surface of the sclera. All right, so when we're looking right here at an angle, what I, what I wanted to show this is that if you look at a trabecular meshwork in a patient with open angle glaucoma, it looks the same as an age match control without glaucoma in light microscopy, meaning that we cannot see the pathology of open angle glaucoma on pathology. Now, the meshwork is different in a 20-year-old as opposed to an 80-year-old, but if you take two 80-year-olds, one with open angle glaucoma, one without, on light microscopy, I can't tell a difference. And so you really can't tell when you look at that. All right, so when we break down glaucoma, we break it into several different anatomical features. So the first thing we look at is we look at open angle glaucoma. And then when we look at open angle glaucoma, you have primary, you know, run-of-the-mill open angle glaucoma, not associated with anything else, but you've also got secondary open angle glaucoma. So we're going to circle back to Catherine. What do we see in here? Um, so you see uh, multiple transillumination defects, 360. Um, so this would be concerning for pigment dispersion. Exactly. So there's an entity called pigment dispersion syndrome. And so people used to argue <coughs> about where does the pigment come from and why does it occur? And you know, if you look at this picture, this tells you you look at the transillumination defects in the iris and you see that it has a, a radial appearance to it. And when you go ahead and, and you look at the back surface of the iris, you see that that lines up directly with the zonular bundles. So, you know, the zonules, remember when we talked about lens, they come along here and then they insert on the ciliary body. Well, this is the back surface of the iris. And so when you have a posterior bowing of the iris, those little zonular bundles will scrape on that pigment epithelium and release pigment, giving you a secondary open angle glaucoma, what we call pigmentary glaucoma. You know, for some reason this occurs in younger myopes, males more than females, why I don't know, but if you do an OCT of the um, anterior segment of the eye, you'll see there'll be posterior bowing of the iris. And then you get this scraping of those zonular bundles releasing the, the pigment. And so when you look, here's a, a really nice path specimen here. 
here's the trabecular mesh. Look, look at all that pigment. So you can imagine what that pigment's going to do. It's going to gum up that mesh wound and cause a secondary glaucoma. And right here, here's the iris. And you can see right there where some of those zonular bundles have scraped off that pigment. So it goes through the pupil, comes around. Predominantly, it's in the inferior angle. Yes. Um, a lot of people have heavily pigmented TM. How can you tell on path that versus um, pigment deposit? What you, yeah, you have a lot of pigment, especially in a darkly pigmented person, you do have a lot of pigment in there. But when you look at the person who's got pigment in the mesh work from just their race or from normal pigment, it's uniform. Whereas if you look at pigment dispersion, it's, it's usually inferior because remember those aqueous currents, they carry the um, pigment around. And also that pigment deposits on the, on the posterior surface of the cornea. What do you call that, Catherine, the pigment deposit from pigment dispersion on the cornea? Spindle. Kuchenberg spindle. So it's this triangular shape area in the inferior third of the cornea. So the aqueous carries it there. So when you go near someone with pigmentary dispersion, you'll actually see that the inferior angle will have more pigment than the superior angle. And also you'll see the translumination defect. So that's real helpful. All right. There's other reasons for secondary open angle glaucoma. Sean, what, what the heck's going on here? So in this picture, there's big mass kind of growing right across or right below the angle kind of pushing the iris away. Um, Sorry. Wrong button. Yeah, it's pretty dark. What so. would you be concerned about? Uh, melanoma. Exactly. So don't forget if you have a malignant melanoma arising from the ciliary body, it can actually invade forward into the trabecular meshwork and you see that widely separated area of the iris root and the mesh work as this tumor pushes in here. So that's another cause of secondary open angle glaucoma is invasion from a tumor, from a ciliary body tumor. And here you can see another one. Here's the cornea, the demarcation, the end of decimus membrane, and here's the iris root. And look, here's this pigmented tumor coming from the ciliary body, growing into the trabecular mesh work and the angle, causing a secondary opening the glaucoma, it's open angle. All right, what are we looking at here, Teresa? So the picture of the anterior segment with the iris dilated, and you can look back and see the lens. There's um, a deposit more peripherally that kind of has like a scalloped edge, so pseudo-exfoliation. All right, so pseudo-exfoliation, or now we call it exfoliation syndrome, can also cause a secondary open angle glaucoma. Why do we have this pattern here, this kind of a bullseye pattern of deposition? Because the iris acts like a windshield wiper. Exactly. So you get these little deposits on the surface of the lens, and as the pupil moves in and out, it scrapes it back and forth. So you get a lot of, of um, exfoliation material here, and you get some in the center, and then it's clear in between where the pupil scrapes it off when it goes. And here's a nice close-up view of that scalloped appearance. So you get this exfoliative material. And now, people have really worked out the genetics. It's the Loxel-1 gene, and it causes a defect in how the elastic tissue in the, uh, matures. And in any event, you get extra material that deposits on the surface of the lens, and you end up getting this um, exfoliative material. And then, of course, that can cause a secondary open angle glaucoma. Now, Exfoliation material deposits all over the eye. So tell me another place where it deposits, Rachel. In the angle. Chris. Uh, besides the angle. What's that? So where if I, I don't know if in the angle is well, I don't know. Well, she said angle. Where else does this stuff deposit? Um, on the lens capsule? Well, we've already oh, we saw that one. That doesn't count. Saw that. It can deposit in the endothelial cells of the cornea. It can deposit in the sphincter and dilator muscles of the iris. It even deposits in the iris pigment epithelium. And it can deposit all along the zonules. And so unfortunately, exfoliation is a triple threat when it comes to cataract surgery. You get deposits on where the zonules insert to the capsular bag along the zonules themselves and where the zonules insert in the ciliary body. So it makes the zonules triply weaker. Also, it makes the capsule more brittle. 
It makes you more susceptible to get glaucoma. It makes the pupil so it doesn't dilate as well. And it gives you more susceptibility to corneal edema. So we see a ton of this here. There's a whole pocket of, of exfoliation in, in Utah. And because it's, it's a disease uh, most commonly seen in people of Northern European ancestry, which is where a lot of Utahns come from. You know, you open the Salt Lake phone book, you see a lot of Sorensons and, you know, Petersons and all that in there. So you see a ton of exfoliation here. So you guys will see that a lot in surgery. And this just shows you nicely on retroillumination that scalloped border. <coughs> okay, so this is, uh, Ariana, what is this called, this pattern of deposition on the lens capsule? This is showing iron filing. Iron filing. So when you were a kid in shop class, did you ever you know, have some iron scrapings, put a magnet on them, and it all stands up on there? Sorry, I come from the non-enlightened era. Boys did shop and girls did home ec, so it was a very non-enlightened thing. You know, girls were supposed to learn how to cook and clean and things. Yeah, see, now that you do both, and guys did shop, you know, manly things, you know, cutting and hammering and manly things. So this is the so-called iron filings pattern. And of course, what we worry about is this exfoliative material deposits in the trabecular meshwork, and so it gums up the meshwork. And these people can get in trouble relatively early. You can watch them and they're doing fine, doing fine, and then suddenly the pressure will really shoot up. And so what's interesting is, is if you do cataract surgery, the intraocular pressure in an exfoliation patient will actually drop by three to five points eventually. And so I think the reasoning, first of all, is, is you widen the angle. So that helps a little bit, but then you remove all that exfoliative tissue that's sitting on the lens capsule. And when you're doing your irrigation and it's floating through there, you're actually flushing out a lot of stuff in the angle. So even though people with exfoliation, you gotta watch them real carefully because they can have a pressure spike the first day. In the long term, especially um, the first few months after surgery, the IOP actually drops. So you end up ungumming the meshwork, if you will. All right. Yes. Is the exfoliative material more like an epithelial in, on pathology? What no, it's 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 <coughs> actually it's it's actually a, a proteinaceous yeah. um, elastin tissue. Okay. Yeah. All right. So this is uh, I guess who did we end up? Did you answer? I think Ariana, you answered one, didn't you? Okay. Allie, what the heck's going on here? What do you see here? Okay, and what does that cause? Okay, good. So at least you guys are reading it because you know I go through this systematically. And I'm going to start like going out of order just to confuse you, but at least you guys are reading ahead of time. So classic history here is, you know, old rancher from Wyoming, um, you know, comes in, eye hurts. How's long it been hurting? Oh, a couple of weeks. It really hurts. I can't see anything. Well, when did your vision get blurry? Ah, oh, it's been there for a while. And then, of course, the spouse always says, oh, he's been blurry for years. He hates doctors. And so by the time they come in, their pressure's 50. They have corneal edema. And what ends up happening is you have a hypermature cataract. The cortex will actually liquefy. Although the capsular bag is intact, protein will leak through that intact capsule. And these are what kind of cells here, Allie? Macrophages. Macrophages. So, you see these macrophages, and look, they're just engorged. They're just stuffed with this proteinaceous material. And so you can imagine these, these big, fat macrophages can clog up the meshwork, but also just the protein can, too. And so these people can get a pretty significant glaucoma, and the treatment is to remove that lens. So that will actually cure this secondary open angle glaucoma, what we call phacolytic glaucoma. It's not really a lysis of the lens, but they call it phacolytic glaucoma. And this is just a, a tap of the anterior chamber when people weren't sure what was going on there. And you see again, big fat macrophages sitting here. All right, so when we think about, about glaucoma, we've been talking about open angle glaucoma now where you've got primary and secondary, but don't forget there are other causes of glaucoma. You can have narrow or Closed angle glaucoma, you can have the opposite, which is angle recession, <coughs> traumatic uh, angle recession where the angle is actually wider than normal. All right, so what are we concerned about here? So um, we've got a, an injected.
affected right eye uh, with some chemosis maybe um, concerned about ankle closure probably yeah look at the what's the tip off here in this picture why would I show both eyes dilated here pupil. exactly so you look there's the, the pupil with the light shining in it constricted pupil here's a mid fixed dilated pupil so these Patients who come in with acute attacks of, of angle closure, they'll often have a mid-position iris, but it doesn't move well. And of course, when we look at, with the slit lamp, the tip-off is, you can actually see the forward bowing of the iris. There's the beam on the cornea, there's the beam on the lens, and then look at the beam here as the iris narrows in the periphery. So you actually get forward bowing, what the French call iris bombe. So it comes forward. and Really what it amounts to is you get a relative pupillary block. And so when people have an angle at risk, they've got a narrow angle to begin with, high hyperopes, big swollen lens, then you dilate them and the pupil dilates fine. It's when the dilation is just beginning to wear off that you get maximum apposition of the iris to the anterior lens capsule. And there you'll get a relative pupillary block. So what's the treatment of this condition? Exactly, so you do laser peripheral aerodectomy, make a hole in there, it allows the aqueous to bypass the pupil and go straight in. And so for those of you who are younger and haven't done a laser PI and someone with an angle closure, it's pretty cool. You hit that iris and, and man, you get this gush of fluid coming through there and the iris will recede right before your eyes. Pretty satisfying. All right, now, if you don't treat an angle closure right away, Catherine, what can happen? Scarring of the ankle. Exactly. What do we call that? Uh, posterior. Wait. Peripheral anterior synechia. Exactly. So we abbreviate it as PAS. You love all the abbreviations in ophthalmology. Peripheral anterior synechia. So when you get apposition of the iris sticking to the peripheral cornea, look, here's the mesh. We're clear back here, and the iris gets stuck. So if you don't break off and angle closure, if it just chronically keeps getting worse, you ac actually can get synechia closing the angle, and then those are, are much more difficult to treat. So this is actually synechia, peripheral anterior synechia, closing the angle there. So a secondary angle closure glaucoma. And here you can see again, apposition of the iris to the peripheral cornea, and there's the mesh work clear back there, closing it off. So, Sean, what's another cause of secondary angle closure? I'll give you a picture of it right here. Uh, neovascular. Neovascularization. What can cause neovascularization? Uh, ischemia, so like chronic uncontrolled diabetes, uh, CRVO. Um, those are the top two. And you can get a chronic ischemia to the eye just from you know, bad circulation in, in general, severe carotid disease. And so when you get chronic ischemia, these ischemic factors will go ahead and diffuse into the anterior segment of the eye and you get abnormal blood vessels growing on the surface of the iris. And eventually these blood vessels can grow on the surface of the iris, then they'll grow all the way over into the angle. So you get a secondary angle closure glaucoma due to neovascularization. So it's a neovascular glaucoma. And there you see, here's the iris, iris pigment epithelium. You've got vessels in the stroma, that's normal. But you shouldn't have vessels on the surface of the iris here. And so that's called rubiosus iridus, you know, red iris. And so you see these little vessels here, and as they grow into the angle, you get a secondary angle closure. And here you can see, this is an area where you've got the iris actually stuck to the lens capsule. So what kind of glaucoma does that cause, Teresa? The, oh, um, uh, like the posterior synechia? Exactly. So this is now a posterior synechia. Posterior to the iris, not anterior. And that iris sticks on there. So you can get posterior synechia, which give you a blocked angle right there. It'll actually, but it's not just that a narrow angle moving back and forth, it's actually the iris sticking down to the lens capsule. 
So you'll get a secondary glaucoma from pupillary block. And here you can see sometimes you'll even get an inflammatory membrane going all the way across. So they call that an occluded angle. So if it zippers up all the way around, they call it pupillary seclusion. But if you get a membrane growing all the way across, which blocks it off, it's pupillary occlusion. So this is an occluded pupil, and you see an inflammatory membrane sticking the remnant lens capsule to the iris, causing a secondary um, you know, pupillary block, and eventually you'll get an angle closure glaucoma. Now, what's going on here? Uh, Rachel. So here's what's left of the meshwork here. Here's the iris root way down here. What's going on here? Exactly. So this is kind of the opposite of the narrow angle, the closed angle. This is an angle that's way wide open. And so this is now an angle recession. And what's the most common cause of this? Trauma, exactly. So it can be automobile accident. Usually it, it, this can be secondary to the two dudes, you know. You guys all heard this, you know, how all trauma is two dudes. Never one, it's two. Man, I was just sitting there minding my own business, and these two dudes just jumped me for no reason. That's the classic story. You know, they're usually drunk and belligerent when they're telling you this. But So they had a run-in with a fist or a foot or, you know, an automobile accident. In any event, you get a severe blunt trauma to the eye. What is associated with these initially? What's the history that, or what do you see on findings often initially associated with this? Hyphema. So you get the eye filling with blood. So you really want to be careful once the hyphema clears and everything's stabilized, wait a month or so, then go neo them and look. So final bonus question. Um, how soon after a severe trauma like this does angle recession glaucoma occur? Yep, seven to 10 years is the average. And so you gotta put the fear of God in these guys because these guys are usually young, stupid males. And that kind of is, is an oxy, you know, that kind of is redundancy because you know, young males are often stupid. Um, and so it's a redundancy to say that. You could say that about your own kind. And so these guys just won't show up for follow-up. And we see these periodically in the clinic. Someone will come in when they're 40 with blurred vision and you look at them and their the pressure's 45 and they've got a temporal island of field and that's all that's left in that eye. And you go back in the old records and sure enough, you know, 20 years ago they had an angle recession. You tell them come in every year and they never do. So I put the fear of God in these guys. I tell them, you know what? You could develop a glaucoma and it's really sneaky. It builds up really slowly over many years and you could go blind if you don't come in every year. And so you never say blind to a patient with macular degeneration or optic neuropathy. You say loss of vision because blind is a very, you know, limbic word. And so if you say blind, it has a pretty good connotation. So these are the guys you say blind to because you really want them to come in because they can lose vision very slowly as their pressure creeps up over <coughs> seven to ten years. This just shows you just the differences. Here's a normal angle. There's the iris root. So technically, it's not so much that the iris root tears, it's almost a tear in the face of the ciliary body. So you get a tear that goes, here's the meshwork here, it goes all the way back here, and then eventually over the years, that meshwork can become sclerotic and cause you to have a secondary um, glaucoma. And here's that meshwork, look at it. It just, it just kind of sclerosis over over the years. You just don't see a good meshwork there. All right, this just kind of shows you, uh, it's a nice picture because we cut it in half. And so here's a patient that's had, look at that angle, angle recession, cataract surgery, look at that nerve, totally cut down nerve slowly over time. All right, so since we're talking about glaucoma, obviously the place where glaucoma causes its damage is at the iris, I mean, at the um, optic nerve. So what are we seeing right here, Chris? So here we're seeing um, a nerve that has pretty large cup to disc ratio, um, which makes us concerned about glaucoma disc damage like this. So where do you think the edge of that disc is, the edge of that cup is, I mean? Kind of hard to tell, maybe right there. This is where you obviously want to look with 
three dimensions. But boy, that's a pretty suspicious looking cup right there. And this one, I think, would be a little bit bigger. And so, I mean, the glaucoma guys are going to talk to you. There's still an argument to this day. You know, the pathology is in the axons of those ganglion cells coming into the, um, you know, cribriform plate and coming into the lamina cribrosa. You know, some people say it's block of axoplasmic flow. Other people say it's chronic ischemia. It may be both. And so in any event, you get chronic damage to the axons as they're passing through. Then you get secondary death of the ganglion cell. And that's what causes the cup to get bigger. And if you don't treat it enough, you get this. So this is a cup to disc ratio of, you know, one. And so this is a totally wiped out, totally wiped out cup with untreated glaucoma. Now, oftentimes you can even see an excavation of the cup. So that's even more than one. You know, that's even if you're calling, you know, cup to disc ratio 0 0.6, 0 0.7, this is like 1.1. So it actually excavates, and this person had a trauma. There is a corneal scar, we call it a leucoma, and you can see he had a ruptured lens, summer ring there, and then severe glaucoma with cupping. So when you look right here, you'll often see temporally, look at that nerve fiber layer, completely gone. There's a single fiber left. And then nasally, you'll often get this vessel going in and then it'll dip down and so it'll, it'll often disappear. You see it go into the disc and then it disappears as it goes down in. And so this is what we call the bean pot. You know, those of you from Boston, you know, you know the bean pot. And so it's actually got a wider atrophy from the edge of the rim than there is actually at the rim itself. So this is a severe end stage glaucoma. And if you look, you'll see that the lamina cribrosa is really bowed backwards. And then, of course, the fibers in the optic nerve are markedly disrupted secondary to the parts <coughs> of this chronic glaucoma. And there you see another one where, I mean, this is totally cupped out, total bean pot. And it's kind of cool looking. It almost looks like those cliffs that, you know, Jeff Tabin climbs up and, you know, you kind of dangle over the edge and climb your way up. All right, this is interesting. This is an optic nerve seen in cross-section, and it's got some focal areas of damage. What, what the heck is that? Mariana. Uh, it's from hyaluronic acid that's okay. extending there. And what causes that? This is, some, this is often an effect from a severe sudden glaucoma. So say you've got someone who goes in an acute pupillary block and their glaucoma goes way up. So you get this, this kind of cavernous atrophy. They call it schnabels, cavernous atrophy. It sounds like something, you know, that you would like, you know, used to shoot when you were a teenager. Oh, man, let's do schnabel shots, you know. <laughs> Come on, humor. Or, 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 yeah. So this is schnabels cavernous atrophy, and it's usually the result of an acute um, high pressurized, and if you do a special stain, you'll actually see that that's hyaluronic acid in there. So people have speculated that the high pressure literally drives that hyaluronic acid from the vitreous into the optic nerve head focally. The other thing that can happen with acute pressurized alley, what part of the eye are we looking at here? So those were damaged to the lens epithelial cells and eventually they evacuate. What are those called? Glaucumflecken. I love that word just because it sounds cool, you know, glaucumflecken. And so it, it can actually, with an acute pressure rise, cause ischemia to the <laughs> anterior lens epithelial cells. And then you'll get these focal opacities that they call glaucumflecken. It's a great word. Now, all right, so what does glaucoma do to the optic nerve? Mix it atrophic, and what part of the nerve gets atrophic? The nerve fiber layer. Exactly, so the ganglion cell layer. Look at the ganglion cell layer here. Totally wiped out nerve fiber layer. So next week we're going to do retinopath. And what do retina, ogres, and onions have in common? They 
layers. layers. And so you guys really better know the layers of the retina. And there's a lot of them. So know the layers of the retina because we're going to talk about them. But glaucoma. Cross section, like this versus a, a section of retina after a CRAO, for example. The only difference is, is a CRAO, remember the central artery brings, brings blood to the inner two thirds of the retina. And so you would actually not only wipe that out, but you'd wipe out the inner nuclear layer and even part of the anterior part of the outer nuclear layer. Whereas this just gets ganglion cells and then secondary nerve fiber layer. So not quite as extensive of damage. And now here you can see, this is an area where they've got damage here. This is the macula of a normal eye. You see the ganglion cells are multiples thick. This is the macula of an eye with severe glaucoma, and look how it's even wiped out the macula. So the macula is the last to go. And that macular papillar bundle is really the last to go. And so people will often have that temporal island and that central vision, and the periphery gets wiped out. But in end-stage glaucoma, even the macula gets wiped out eventually. All right, we're going to talk about a couple of other um, different entities that can cause glaucoma that you need to know about. So this is something that you may see with the PEDS people. This is congenital glaucoma. And so back in the olden days when I was a resident, they called this Barkan's membrane. And they said, well, this, there's a membrane that grows across the angle in kids with glaucoma. And the way you treated it, we used to do what's called a goniotomy. And so now these guys, people have discovered the angle again because the glaucoma guys are putting all these little chunts in in these mix procedures. And so we would look in there with this, this, this funny lens called a Kepi lens, and you'd look at the angle and you'd go across the cornea with a blade and you'd go, and you just cut the angle. And the idea would be you'd, you'd cut Barkan's membrane and then magically the, <coughs> the glaucoma would go down. <coughs> well, as we studied it more, we discovered that it's not so much it's a membrane growing across the angle in kids with glaucoma, it's that the angle just doesn't form normally. So you get this connective tissue here, but you don't have a normal angle behind it. What we were doing in essence is we were just cutting a big swath that allow aqueous to go into either Slum's canal, even if it was there, maybe even just the face of the ciliary body. So we were just giving a way for fluid to go, kind of like people are doing now with MIGS. So we were just, you know, 35 years ahead of our time and didn't know it. And so this is a congenital glaucoma. You get this membrane-like structure over it, but you don't really get a normal um, angle developing. And there you see it. There's the angle. There's Barkan's membrane. There's the angle in congenital glaucoma. So the angle just doesn't develop well. It's just not normal. All right, so there is an entity that we want to talk about today, and that is the ICE syndrome. Catherine, what does ICE stand for? Um, Eridocorneal something endothelial. Yeah, know. irritocorneal endothelial syndrome, so ICE syndrome. Um, Sean, bilateral or unilateral? Um, I think this could be unilateral. Yeah. So again, I got to teach you guys now because for oral boards, you say it with conviction. <laughs> so even if you're guessing, you say unilateral. If you go uh, unilateral, <laughs> then they know you're guessing. You don't get credit for it. So just put it out there, okay? So it's usually unilateral. It's very interesting. All right, Teresa. So there are three parts of, of ice syndrome, depending on if you're a lumper or a splitter. And so what are the, what's the first one? What am I showing here? Um, so essential iris atrophy. All right, so it's called essential iris atrophy. And if you look here, they've got what's called corectopia, the pupil's abnormal. You even get what's called polychoria, multiple pupils. And so you see a moth-eaten iris, multiple pupils here, and they can get a severe glaucoma from this. Um, Rachel, what is the common, common final pathway of all of these ice these three different entities of ICE syndrome. Exactly. So you get this abnormal endothelium growing 
into the angle, which causes glaucoma, but even grow on onto the iris. And so the first one, most common one, is called essential iris atrophy. Uh, Chris, what's the second entity of the triad here? Yeah, the second one is Chandler syndrome. Chandler syndrome. And so these all have common things. Chandler syndrome, you still get polychoria, you still get glaucoma, but what does Chandler syndrome get in addition to that? Corneal edema. So here you see the corneal edema, hazy, cloudy cornea. So Chandler syndrome has very similar to essential iris atrophy, but with corneal edema. And then the third one, Ariana? These are iris nevi and All right, so you get, it's called Cogan reese syndrome or iris nevis syndrome. And so if you look, you see these little pigmented bumps sitting on the iris. So Cogan reese or iris nevis syndrome. And when you look at the pathology in all of these, it's the same, and it's called the desmetization of the angle. So abnormal endothelial cells grow all the way across the angle. They close off the angle completely, and they start laying decimase membrane even on the iris. And you look right here, look at that decimase membrane. It goes all the way over to the angle, but here on the surface of the iris. Allie, what stain is this? PAS. PAS. Why? Why would we do that? Exactly. And that is what decimase membrane is. So you see decimase membrane really thick, covering the angle, covering the surface of the iris. So that's kind of the common denominator in all of these ice syndrome patients. And here we have, this is actually peripheral iridectomy that they did. So this is pretty cool. A patient had ice, did a peripheral iridectomy. PAS stain again, look, here's decimase membrane on the anterior surface of the iris. And then we go to higher power, sure enough, there's the iris, there's decimase membrane right there. And if you look carefully, you can see melanocytes popping through forming that little iris nevus that you see in these. And so this was cool. This was the cover of the Archives of Ophthalmology. And so it's my only archives cover. So we made the cover with, with this cool looking <coughs> syndrome. And there you can see again these iris nevi on the surface in Kogan Reese. All right, now there's another entity you need to know that can be associated with, well, a group of entities that you need to know that can be associated with um, glaucoma, and the way I like to memorize these, there's a, patient, there's a paper George Waring wrote literally 40 years ago um, about the stepladder classification. What are we talking about here, Becca? Um, like Peter's anomaly and uh, um, I'm blanking. What do we call the whole category, though? Um, Wrongly, by the way. The posterior embryo toxin. Well, that's what this is, but what's the whole umbrella called? That's another <laughs> string of the umbrella. <laughs> so these are called the anterior chamber cleavage syndromes. And so wrongly, we thought that when the eye was forming, you'd get this wave of mesoderm coming out and that it improperly cleaved and then left you with these syndromes. Right here. So they called it the anterior chamber cleavage. Now we know that it's not mesoderm, it's actually neural crest, and it really isn't a problem with cleaving. But that that name is stuck to the literature, so it's the anterior chamber cleavage syndromes. And so, what is this here, Becca? That's a posterior embryo. Posterior embryo toxin. So the first thing you see in these is you see a thickened, anteriorly displaced Schwabi's line. So you see it's thickened, and instead of having to look with the gonium mirror, you can actually see Schwabi's line in these kids, even with a slit lamp. And so you see this anterior display shrugs, that's called posterior embryo toxin. They thought this was due to some toxicity during the you know, growth of the embryo, and so that's why they called it that. And here you have a close-up. That's the Schwabi's line. That, that's, okay, now what's the next kind of step in the stepladder, Catherine? So you see the posterior embryo toxin? There's posterior embryo toxin real nicely. What else are you seeing here? Uh, scarring over the, or scarring over the 
angle? Yeah, so you got scarring over the angle, you start to get some thinning of the iris here. What do we call this? Exactly. So we used to split them into two, Axenfeld, Rieger's anomaly. And so it, the, now people just put it together because it's kind of the same thing. So the next thing in the stepladder, you still have posterior embryo toxin, but then you start to get these little fibers growing from the um, decimese membrane all the way to the, across the angle. You start getting thinning of the iris. Now, there is actually a Rieger's syndrome, if you will. And so these kids are just funny kids. They've got weird teeth and skeletal anomalies and other funny things with them and so but in the eye you know axenfelds used to be just the the things across the angle and then Riegers was when you started to get the iris atrophy but now they've lumped that together into axenfeld Riegers anomaly now this is a little bit different sean what is this one Call this one. Uh, this is Peter's anomaly. So Peter's anomaly is characterized by a central dense opaqueness in the cornea. Now you still have the other things with it, but in addition to that, you start to get this. And what Peter's anomaly is characterized by is you get, for some reason, the posterior cornea just doesn't form well in the center. So you don't get endothelial cells, you don't get dysmus membrane. So you get this dense scarring in the center. You still have the iris atrophied. You've still got the, you know, synechia there. And so what I like, and, and what these people also have is they'll have a funny anterior polar cataract. And so, so I like to think of it, it's, it's like the, the lens went up and took a bite out of the central cornea and pull, pulled it down with it. So there's this little opacity in the lens and then there's this bite in the center of the cornea and you see decimase membrane is just gone in Peter's anomaly and endothelium in the center so you get this opaqueness in the center and, and that's called an, an internal ulcer of von Hippel and so if you notice a theme here virtually all eye terms were described by Austrians and Germans you know in the late 1800s and so von Hippel as in von Hippel Lindau syndrome and so it's an internal ulcer of von Hippel and that's a characteristic finding in Peter's anomaly so again, if, if you're trying to learn these and memorize these and know them for boards, I find the stepladder classification a good way to do that. And everybody's brain works differently. My brain is, is I'm, I'm not a lumper, I'm a splitter, so my brain is like your mailboxes upstairs. Every entity has a little box in there and that's how I keep track of them. And so if you think of this, the whole broad umbrella is anterior chamber cleavage syndrome, but you remember the little boxes of, of you know, the, um, posterior embryo toxin, Atzikfel Riegers, Peters, then it helps you understand what's going on with these. Okay, and there's the gardens behind Versailles. Um, this is a huge garden. I mean, it could take half a day to walk through these, and there's ponds and beautiful flowers and all, but they had a horrible storm in Paris a couple years ago, and it took out 10 thousand trees um, in the in the area around Versailles from the winds. Hurricane winds took them out. So amazing what weather can do. So this is Versailles. So next week, layers. Okay. <laughs> Questions on glaucoma, angle pathology of glaucoma. All right, great.